consultants at, at uh, the BC Women's Complex Chronic Disease Program. I used to be a colleague of Rick um, and still consider myself lucky to, to know him. And then I also do interventional pain over at Change Pain Clinic. So that's my background. So today's topic is chronic pain and nutrition are the two really linked. And this is part two. Uh, so this is going to be a continuation of what we chatted about last time. Um, is Can I just maybe get, um, maybe from a show of hands, um, Individual, the raise hand function is is disabled as well. <laughs> this. Rick, are you still? Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but we've lost your slides. Lost. Okay, we can put those back up. Um, I I think I was asking. Can I maybe get a show of hands from some thumbs up? How many of you attended last week's presentation? Okay, so quite a few of you, that's great. That gives me an idea of, of how much to go through the, the content that we covered last time. Um, so in terms of disclosures, I have no financial disclosures. I don't have any relationships with um, anything nutrition, vitamin or lab testing wise. I am a health contributor for CBC, so you may see me on there. I'm not paid by CBC, uh, so everything that I share there is, is my own medical opinion. And then everything I share here today, as always, is evidence-based or based on high-level expert opinion. Um, so again, nothing that I, I comment on here today am I paid for in any any part. And I think that's an important disclosure. Uh, just as I mentioned last time, there is so much advertising and marketing behind nutrition and diets and vitamins that I, I think knowing who's giving you the information is really important. So our objectives are similar, but to build on, on last week. Uh, so we want to summarize the role nutrition and dietary habits have and how we can manage our chronic pain and fatigue. I want to have you leave here knowing that you have more strategies and how to modify your diet to optimize pain control, whether those are big changes or small, uh, and by doing so, what foods to avoid and what to increase. And then that means you leave here empowered to make the best choices for your body. So some of the comments I got last week were, well, you said this component, but it doesn't work for me. Should I still do it? I, I have sensitivities. And the answer is, when we talk about dietary recommendations, it's not one size fits all. I'm going to give you 20 or 30 recommendations. And your job is to pick the ones that work best for your pain and fatigue. So please don't feel as though um, everything I say has to be implemented into your, your routine. Um, when you talk about personalized medicine or precision medicine, um, which we can't do here in a group setting, that's really what, what's best for patients. Uh, but your job is to take what I say and implement it based on what you need. And then I really wanna answer the questions were, that were left over from part one. I think we had close to 250 questions and we obviously didn't get through them all. Uh, so we'll answer those through the PowerPoint format and then we'll open this up to a Q&A session so we can continue the, the questions um, from last time. Okay, I'm just going through the chat box here. Um, and then I, I think one of the things I think I had chatted about with Bruno was um, sending out the PowerPoint slides. Did anyone get those or should we try and redistribute those? I got some thumbs up saying, no, I, maybe I'll, I'll get, get those yeah, answers. Let's I think Bruno, Bruno did send them out. Okay, so what we'll do is I'll send out um, part two and part one to everyone who attends today. So you might get a duplicate, but if you didn't attend last time, you can certainly go through my slides and um, we'll probably have that one again. So the things that I'll share today, um, this is sort of a, a quick hitters, um, foods to avoid, foods you should eat more of, and then what science tells us about the foods we consume, our pain and our mental health. And of course, the things I won't share today, so no new fat diets, nothing unproven. Um, and then I got some very specific individualized questions related to um, specific patient management. It's really difficult to make medical recommendations if I don't have your full context or medical background. Um, and so those questions I, I will defer, not because I don't want to, but I, I simply can't give a, a correct answer in this type of format. 
Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a pain physician in, in various different settings. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that both places I work at focus on a multidisciplinary full body approach to pain, and I should add fatigue management as well. So physiotherapists, dietitians, social work, somatic therapy, acupuncture. Um, this is not, um, these are not conditions that we can manage uh, simply with a medication or one intervention. These are things that uh, uh, really do require a team to help you improve. And so I, I think the question people often ask is, is there a link between pain and nutrition? And the answer is yes, there is absolutely a link between the foods we consume, um, the pain that our patients experience, and your overall health status. So when we're going to talk about the Mediterranean diet, it's not going to be just about pain, but there are going to be links to heart health, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and overall cognitive function. Um, and so you you can sort of think of it as not just helping your, your pain, but sort of your overall health and wellness uh, status. And so what is the optimal dietary pattern? Does it exist? Um, oh, I think we missed through some slides here. Um, and the question is, or the answer is yes, we do in fact have a better way to consume nutrition. Um, and so that that pattern of eating that we talk about is actually known as the Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean pattern of eating. Um, and I apologize to those of you where this is repetition, but uh, for those of you that this is new, I, I really I summarized what we talked about last time in a few short slides. Um, and for those of you who listened last time, I think it's a, a good reminder as well. When we talk about optimizing nutrition, there are some key points we want to focus on. We want to improve the quality of your diet so your micronutrient requirements are met. So when you talk about micronutrients, we're talking about proteins, carbohydrates, sugars, um, uh, and protein content. So all of those different micronutrients are required in various balances. We want to make sure we're not having too many, say, fats or carbohydrates and missing out on proteins. We also want to reduce the pro-inflammatory mediators that produce oxidative damage. And when you have chronic pain and chronic fatigue, that first point is really important. In both fibromyalgia, central sensitivity syndromes, and chronic fatigue syndrome, we know there is a low-grade inflammatory response that's resulting in an ongoing pain processing disorder and a fatiguing process on, and the impact that has on your mitochondria. And so if the foods that we eat are triggering inflammatory mediators and creating adverse reactions in our body, which often manifest in the form of brain fog, fatigue, worsening pain, uh, gut dysfunction, bloating, that generally tells us that the foods we're consuming are probably perpetuating our pain and fatigue. And that's a very simplified way to talk about it. Um, but it's one of the key ways that we can actually modify the pain and fatigue that we experience. And so when we talk about optimizing nutrition, we want to reduce those pro-inflammatory mediators that are resulting in damage. And instead, we want to promote the intake of foods that actually have anti-inflammatory properties. And so we don't want to take away any of our micronutrients. So like I mentioned last time, there used to be a big push for low fat diets, low carbohydrate diets. It's not about reducing the quantity of a certain micronutrient. We actually want to focus on high quality fats, high quality uh, carbohydrates, and we actually want to promote the intake of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and there were a number of questions on the omega-3 fatty acids last time. Uh, and so I will elaborate a bit more on that um, in terms of how much to take and, and what we recommend. And then finally, you want to support your gut function with adequate hydration. So we're looking at at least two liters of fluids per day and adequate fiber intake to support gut motility um, and nutrient absorption. And we're looking at about 30 grams per day for the average patient. And I think I, I see some of these questions popping up, and I think a lot of them are uh, actually quite similar to the, the questions that I'll be addressing just through the slides. Um, so hopefully we can answer the, those in, in big batches. Um, 
We also want to talk about optimizing your lean body mass when we talk about optimizing nutrition. Um, so when we talk about lean body mass, we're talking about the muscle content of your body. So that muscle to fat ratio. We rec oh. We recommend about 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per kilogram per day. So if you're a 70 kilogram individual, we recommend about 70 grams of protein per day. And that can come in the form of animal-based protein, come in the form of plant-based protein. Um, and again, lots of questions on what type of food should I eat to get protein. I will have a table for you moving forward um, in the coming slides. And really important when we talk about reducing the pro-inflammatory mediators, we want to have our total daily fat intake be less than 7% in saturated fats. So there's various types of fats uh, that we can consume through our diet. So there's trans fats, there's saturated fats, and there's fats that our body can actually break down and has the enzymes for. And so the fats that we want to avoid are the ones that are pro-inflammatory, and those are definitely our trans fats and our saturated fats. So when you, if you look at the box of, say, a prepackaged um, meal that you purchase, you want to aim for that less than 7% total fat intake. So not just per meal, but your overall fat intake should be less than 7% of saturated fats. And again, you don't want to avoid fat intake. You just want to switch the type of fats that you have. Um, so fats are really important to help maintain regular cell function, cell metabolism. So if we don't have enough fat in our body, we actually can't optimize our body's metabolism. And same thing goes for carbohydrates. If you don't have enough carbohydrates in your, um, in your diet, um, that often contributes to a feeling of fatigue. So we want to stay away from those refined carbohydrates, uh, the white uh, flowers, and switch to those high quality carbohydrates. And one of the questions that came up a number of times last time is that, um, what are good carbohydrates? And the answer to that is anything that's not refined. Um, so couscous is great, quinoa is great, brown rice is a nice substitute sweet potatoes are an option. Uh, so there are a number of ways that you can consume carbohydrates, including fruits and vegetables, without actually getting those starchy carbohydrates that patients, um, if you're attending through Dr. Arsenault's programming, uh, tend to be quite sensitive to. And so this pattern of eating that I just talked about, and we did five or six key points, is actually reflected in a phrase many of you probably already know. It's known as the Mediterranean diet. Um, other times it's known as the anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, and so if you go on to Google, you might find various versions of it. But the key focus in this pattern of eating is that there is a focus on anti-inflammatory foods. And so you really want to increase your intake of fruits, vegetables, and good quality carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And you really want to eliminate those highly processed um, uh, packaged foods that tend to have additives that promote that inflammatory focus in your body. So if you have mast cell activation syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome, and you find that you're not tolerating many of those packaged foods, uh, it's probably due to the fact that all of those additives uh, make it harder for our bodies to digest those food. And so you create this large inflammatory response. So foods that tend to cause inflammation. Um, so again, these are foods we really want to limit um, or if possible um, eliminate uh, from our diets. Uh, we're talking about refined carbohydrates. So white breads, pastries, croissants, um, highly processed bagels, um, French fries and anything else that's fried or deep fried, of course. Um, I mentioned last time how the, the fruit juices are not a substitute for uh, our natural fruits. Um, they contain a lot of added sugar and are quite pro-inflammatory. Um, sodas, any sort of sugar-sweetened beverages, please stay away from those if you can. They're quite high in those um, uh, synthetic sugars. Um, a lot of concern about the, the impact of red meat. Um, 
and and uh, the role it has in our, our body and the fact that it's so prevalent in many of our Western diets. So our red meats, burger steaks, especially our processed meats like deli meats, hot dogs, sausages, um, things that you find on charcuterie boards are particularly pro-inflammatory. Um, I think someone asked last time, well, is there enough data to show that red meats are in fact a carcinogen? Um, and so we actually have level one evidence that our red meats do in fact cause colon cancer. So it's not um, it's not up for debate and it's, it's something that we have very good robust evidence in. Um, and again, a lot of it is related to these processed meats where they're uh, packaged and salted and processed uh, where the additives are, are put in. And so really, if you can avoid these red meats and make substitutes for other types of white meats, um, lean meats like chicken and turkey, uh, you're on the right path. Of course, margarine, shorten and lard, these are all staples, uh, particularly for me. Uh, when I was growing up every day, my breakfast was uh, toast with margarine. Um, uh, I, I think many of these foods we just assumed uh, were okay to have and were really starting to understand the role that has on heart disease uh, and, and our pro-inflammatory mediators. And I think I would summarize this slide by saying all of these are examples of really ultra processed foods. And that's a term that's coming out quite frequently lately. I've, I've seen it in the Globe and Mail. Um, their health columnist did a, a recent article on it. They're called UPFs. Um, and these are foods where essentially you're eating almost as many, if not more additives than the actual food that's that's has the nutritional content. So if you can stay away from these ultra processed foods, um, I think you're, you're also on the right track of, of making some key changes. Um, just a little bit more on these ultra processed foods uh, before we jump in. Uh, to the questions. Oh, it looks like we lost our slides there. Sorry about that, folks. Just give me a moment here. Can I'll see my slides now? Wonderful. Okay. So our unprocessed or minimally processed foods are essentially the type of foods where our vitamins and nutrients are intact. Whereas these ultra processed foods, we've essentially released all of the good qualities that are available in them. Um, for instance, an apple pie, you've really lose the nutrition and the apple and you end up getting all of the added sugars um, and saturated and trans fats uh, that come along with it. And so that food isn't really in its natural state. Um, if you're looking for examples of, of non ultra processed foods or minimally processed foods, uh, chicken, apples, carrots, unsalted nuts are all re easy to understand examples. Uh, and the reason we, we get concerned about processing is that it changes the food from its natural state. And so you're, instead, you're getting a lot of salt, oil, and sugar. And this is one of the main reasons why that red meat um, is so pro-inflammatory and puts you at risk for colon cancer is that many of the red meats that we get are highly processed. Uh, there was a lot of question about, well, what about grass fed or um, just pork by itself or just ground beef if I get it from the farm? Um, there is still a relationship between red meat and pro-inflammatory mediators and long-term effects of colon cancer. However, if you consume less than 50 grams of red meat per day that is not highly processed, um, that you have once or twice a month, which the Mediterranean diet uh, guidelines do recommend, that's okay. It's the dietary patterns where you're having a lot of this processed red meat three, four times a week with a lot of the added oils and salt that is resulting in those higher risks of um, 
uh, of colon cancer. So there are some nuances, um, but by and large, you also don't get the same positive omega-3 fatty acids that you would say get from seafood um, by instead eating grass-fed red meat. So it's not just the elimination of the red meat, it's what you're using instead of the red meat that's important as well. Um, and then finally, just to close off the ultra processed foods, um, anything with a lot of artificial colors and preservatives, um, you know, anything with um, ex that are substances that are extracted like fats, starches, sugars, hydrogenated fats, um, stabilizers, all of those things contribute to the processing of the foods. Um, and again, you end up eating more of those additives than you do the nutritional components. Um, so just an example of, of some of our minimally processed to ultra processed foods. And so you can sort of create these um, spectrums in your own mind. So there's corn, there's canned corn that's processed, and then there's corn chips. So very different nutrient content, um, despite corn being in each of those type of foods. Um, same thing goes for wheat. So wheat just by itself is minimally processed. You process it by turning it into flour. And then you can eventually make that into an ultra processed food by getting cookies um, out of the package. So again, it's not the um, individual food by itself, like apple, it's how that food is processed that, that we get concerned about. And, and that, you know, the fact that 58% of calories that are eaten in the United States are ultra processed uh, is probably a major, major reason out, in addition to portion sizes as to why there is an obesity epidemic um, in the United States, um, but also uh, uh, an endemic uh, nature of heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. So these, all these things come hand in hand um, and you definitely want to avoid them if you have any form of central sensitivity syndrome. So really, um, it's the non-nutrient components in ultra-processed foods that causes this persistent, low-grade inflammation that alters our gut health and then promotes and aggravates more chronic diseases. And so that includes chronic pain and chronic fatigue. You also end up with foods that are very calorically dense, nutritionally poor, and often don't have enough protein. And so we don't have the building blocks for our bodies to move forward, literally and figuratively, and perpetuates low-grade inflammation. So if you have chronic fatigue syndrome and you have one usable hour in your home uh, to walk around and you don't have the muscle mass to support that mobility, it's going to perpetuate and exaggerate uh, your mobility challenges. So really making sure that the food that you eat, um, whatever you can tolerate is nutritionally dense is really important. Um, and then as, as I've listed here, it's a complex relationship. It's, um, these are very simple overarching uh, statements that I'm making because it's not easy to summarize, but we know the data is there and that optimizing your diet is a critical part of what we call whole person care for all of our central sensitivity syndromes and chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm just gonna take a pause for a minute and just see how we're doing on our chat box here. Just some quick hitters I think I can answer. I think Amanda asked, what about white rice? White rice is okay. It, it tends to be, again, be more processed than brown rice. So if you're gonna have rice, try and have that brown rice as an option. Um, and then the rest of the questions, I, I think this is great. Everybody is asking the same questions as, as last time or some sort of uh, um, similarity. So things that we want to have you eat more of is fruits and green leafy vegetables. So as I mentioned last time, if you imagine your plate um, as a circle and you cut that plate in half, half of your plate should be fruits and green leafy vegetables. It doesn't matter what type of leafy vegetable. If you don't tolerate, say, zucchini, uh, but spinach is a great option, 
that's fine as well. You just want it to look like the rainbow on half of your plate. You then take that remaining half and you cut it into quarters and that one quarter left is your proteins. So ideally we wanna do things like fish or seafood or plant-based protein. So that can be nuts, beans, lentils, um, again, chicken and turkey are a wonderful option as well. And the reason we're really big on fish is because salmon and seafood have higher contents of omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which are both heart healthy um, and anti-inflammatory. Um, and have a number of other uh, uh, positive uh, roles and in, in, um, or positive aspects to to our overall health. Um, fish also has some of the or salmon in particular has some of the highest um, content of omega three fatty acids. Um, but if you're a vegetarian or you prefer not to eat fish, I'll go through some other ways that you can get that protein. When we talk about fats, we want those monounsaturated fats, um, so olive oil to cook and flavor your food whenever possible. Um, not only, again, do you get that omega-3 fatty acid content through olive oil, but you're also eliminating the saturated and trans fats that are found in things like margarine, butter, lard, um, and I, I know there are some options to get uh, naturally churned grass-fed butter. I'm not talking about those more expensive options um, that are hard to get. I'm talking about the ones that um, uh, um, uh, our, our general Canadians tend to have the most easiest access to. Um, so if you go to Superstore, you're probably going to find Basel um, and you're going to find the butter that uh, is filled with salt. So if you found some alternatives, I, I think that's great. Um, but those options often aren't cost effective um, or even an option for, for many of our patients here. Um, and then alcohol, um, I harped on this a little bit last time. I think this is my own little soapbox. I, I really thought the alcohol guidelines are, are too soft. Um, they have recently been changed um, to recommend uh, no more than three to four glasses a week of, of alcohol for both males and females. Uh, the Mediterranean diet says one glass a day for women, two glasses of wine per day for men. This is often red wine. Um, but again, I, I am going to say the wine that you drink in these Mediterranean areas is not the same as the wine that has been processed with additives and is on the shelves of our local BC liquor store. So um, that's my piece on on wine. And I, and, and I will also say there's a role, but there, there's absolutely a connection between anxiety, depression um, and regular alcohol consumption. Um, as well as our long-term cognitive function. Um, and so really just think about the way that alcohol not only affects your pain, but your overall health and how you feel the next day after drinking it. Um, and I will preface this say by saying I, I enjoy my own glass of red wine. Um, but uh, again, um, I, I, I think I would, I definitely would not agree with the 10 glasses a week that the previous Canadian guidelines were on. So that, that's my soapbox and I won't, won't say anything else about that. Um, so really the key features that we're looking for in the Mediterranean diet is we want to get your healthy fats in with extra virgin olive oil, nuts, seeds, and omega-3 fatty acids. All of these in this top line are going to be great sources of anti-inflammatory um, uh, uh, components that you're looking for. You want to support your gut health with fiber, so you want to be able to absorb the nutrients, you want to be able to have regular bowel movements. Um, and you can do that with daily vegetables, fruit, whole grain breads, uh, beans, peas, lentils. Uh, we want you to focus on cooking food that's fresh and at home. Um, one, uh, it lets you think about the food that you're consuming. Um, two, if you have someone at home that you can cook with, there's a social component to it. And three, um, it helps eliminate some of those additives and preservatives that we get from food that comes off the shelf. Um, however, I also know the audience I'm speaking to, and many of you um, have difficulty chopping vegetables, um, grocery shopping. It's just not within your energy capacity. Um, so if you're able to do this, great. Um, if it's not an option for you and it's going to make you crash, please do the best that you can. Um, but my goal here today was to give you the best possible uh, recommendations. And if there's a way for you to choose things that are a bit more fresh, um, uh, I, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, you want to eat smaller portions of, of high quality food. So again, it's not just about um, 
a calorie isn't the same calorie as another calorie. Um, that's a saying that goes out there. So not all calories are built the same. Um, it's about the micronutrients that are located in the foods that you're eating. Um, so just because something has five grams of fat, that doesn't mean five grams of omega-3 fatty acids are the same as five grams of saturated or trans fats. And again, just keep that wine in moderation. Uh, there were some questions about the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so I, I just included a specific slide on this again. Um, the types of fats that are consumed can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And the reason we like omega-3 fatty acids so much is they support the production of the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So where can we get these? We can definitely get them through your diet. You don't necessarily need them through a supplement. Um, so fish, so salmon particularly, things like flaxseed, nuts, seeds, olive oil are all great sources. But if you feel like you're not getting enough or you really want to top up what you're getting, a fish oil supplement with an EPA to DHA ratio of over 1.5, that ratio is often on the label of, of the supplement that you're buying. And one of the questions that came up was, well, I'm vegan or I have a seafood allergy. How do I take fish oil supplements? You can get other omega-3 fatty acids that are vegan or vegetarian on the market now, uh, particularly here in the lower mainland. Um, and really, you want to eliminate these pro-inflammatory fats that are polyunsaturated fats. So things like sunflower oils and saturated fats as much as possible. Um, so this is our Mediterranean pyramid. Um, this will be sent out in in the slides again. So I won't I won't focus in on this too much, but it just sort of gives you an idea of the types of foods you want to have daily versus weekly uh, versus monthly. And you'll notice that there is still things like red meat and sweets and alcohol in the pyramid. So it's not about complete elimination. It's just about picking and choosing when you consume those products and making sure you prioritize the rainbow of fruits and vegetables, the healthy fats, and the whole grains as much as possible. And then also acknowledge that there is a daily physical activity at the very bottom of the pyramid. Um, again, really hard if you have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome and you're often in bed. So you can ignore this part um, if you're not able to um, engage in this. Um, but just do know that when we eliminate this daily physical activity, it actually makes the foods that we eat that much more important um, in ma managing our chronic pain and our heart health. Um, so, it, you know, just making sure we know where we can make up for our um, inability to engage in physical activity. Um, so I'll take a, a pause there. I think that was exactly half an hour to summarize um, uh, what we talked about last time. I see about 80 questions that have come in. Um, so many of them I'm, I'm going to cover in this question and answer period because um, they're tied into the questions that were asked last time. Um, and then I think I got about 25 emails from Bruno uh, at about 520 with the, the questions from last time as well. So if there is anything I haven't covered, um, by the time it, it comes to 645, put your questions in again and I'm sure we'll have time to get through them. So lots of time today for, for questions. So how do you measure adipose tissue was one of the, the first questions. Um, and we talked about this in the context of your um, uh, BMI, maybe not being the best measure, but we're also looking at things like, um, uh, sorry, I just have a, a meeting next door to me. I'm just going to pause you for one moment here. Sorry about that. I guess that's what happens when you do your 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 um, sessions uh, in your living room. Um, so the the question is asked in the context of um, uh, your body mass index um, and how relevant of a, of a feature is that in understanding our our health and well being. Um, so BMI is important, um, but also understanding the ratio of muscle to fat is important as well, and we can get an idea of our body fat. Um, uh, measurements by either using calipers. Um, often we want someone who's trained and how to do them. Um, 
Uh, and so you, you can sort of measure the thickness of, of various skin folds throughout your body. Um, but then you can also purchase devices off of a place simply like Amazon, and they basically send a bioelectrical resistance through your body, and that gives you an idea of your body fat index and will give you a measure. Um, I will caution you, it depends on your water content as well. So if you're going to get one of these devices and you're curious, um, I would do it first thing in the morning before eating and drinking. Um, the other question was to just clarify about protein intake. So it is 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight. So if you're 100 kilograms, that's about um, uh, 80 to 100 grams of protein per day. Um, I see my sentence got a bit cut off there. And that recommendation is for your average adult. Um, so if you're highly active, um, those protein requirements go up. Um, and if you're more sedentary or not able to exert yourself, you can probably do a little bit less. Uh, but on average, you, you want to hit that about 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight requirement. Uh, so I think this this was a pretty popular question last time. So um, where do I get protein from if um, if I'm looking for something other than just uh, animal meat products? So for reference, three ounces of tuna or salmon is about 21 grams. Um, chicken or turkey is about 19. And then you can actually do about an ounce of nuts and get seven grams of protein. And then one egg is six grams. Um, and so if you want, you can you can screenshot this or wait until the slides come out. Um, but there's various options on how you can get that protein content um, in and you can keep it varied as well. So Greek yogurt, clotted cheese, cooked beans, milk, pasta. Um, and so for those of you who do like a FODMAP diet or an elimination diet, um, uh, we can um, go, you know, I'd, I'd actually recommend working with the dietitian that you're seeing for the FODMAP diet and seeing how you can maximize your protein and take through the FODMAP diet. Um, there were questions related to dietitians who can support um, our patient population here. Um, if you've been through the complex chronic disease program or you're on the wait list, I think we have some fantastic dietitians with Michelle uh, in particular there. Um, but there's also a, a plethora of dietitians actually throughout the <laughs> lower mainland who you can see. And the best way to do this is actually through bcdietitians.ca. So I'm just going to stop my screen share. Uh, and I'm going to switch over to their website. Everyone can see my, my browser there. that great um so this is bcdietitians.ca and the reason I, I don't mention um any specific dietitians outside of the ones that i've worked with um are that it can be really individualized and personal on who you connect with so what i think is more helpful is to give you the resource on where to find dietitians who specialize in certain areas so these are all dietitians that are registered um, in british columbia and you can actually search by their focus of practice or things that they're comfortable. So um, gut health is one of them. Um, meal planning is another one of them. Um, uh, for those of you who are vegetarian or want to focus on weight loss, uh, but for our primarily our CFS and our fibromyalgia patients, the gut health, just because there's often the IBS component that coexists, um, is where I would start. And then you can also filter by location as well. So um, if I give you a recommendation for Vancouver, it's not helpful if you live out in Langley or you're on the, the island. So um, this, I think, is a great starting point, um, and I think, Rick, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Do we have the CCDP dietitians come in for special lecture series? Yes, there's four coming up in the near future. Awesome. Okay. Um, and so they're, they're a wealth of knowledge as well. And Rick, you can see my slides back up there again. 
Great. Okay. Um, there's actually quite a number of questions about pots management and salt. So the questions were, do I take all the salt at once or in divided doses? Um, and the answer is you want to divide it up. So the total amount that you want in a day of added salt, if you have pots or with a static intolerance is one teaspoon. That's about nine grams of salt per day. And you want to divide that up into four. Um, so a quarter teaspoon, four times a day, and you want to dissolve it in a liquid. Um, that's our general starting recommendation. I have some folks who go up to like a teaspoon and a half or even two teaspoons, um, but those folks tend to have more um, irregularities on your on their blood work. So if you've, if you've done your blood work, your physician tells you your salt levels or your sodium levels are normal, start with a one teaspoon and take it up to, to four times per day. Um, PEA, I think I had about six variants of the questions, so I, I've included them all here. Um, how do I take PEA? Does it work for migraines and are there side effects? Um, and so I'm going to quote Dr. Arsenault, who I once, I don't know if he remembers, but he once told me PEA is actually the supplement for people who don't tolerate anything else. So there are no known or patient experiences in my clinical practice with GI side effects. So if you're worried about side effects and you're interested in taking a medication or a supplement, PEA is a great place to start. It's a 400 milligram tablet three times a day. So you're looking at about 1.2 grams or 1200 milligrams on a daily basis. Um, and when it comes to migraines, I don't have specific data for migraines and, and PEA supplements, but we do have data on the coenzyme Q10 and magnesium for migraines. As a general principle, I would say that migraines are a central sensitivity syndrome, and I would recommend PEA to anyone who has CSS. So if you have migraine headaches, I would say go ahead and try the PEA in addition to the other things that you're doing for your migraines. Um, how much omega-3 fatty acids should I take in a day and do they all contain seafood? Um, so to the an answer the second part, um, no, they don't all contain seafood. So you can get those vegan and vegetarian capsules like I mentioned. Um, we recommend a da total daily dose of three grams per day. And if you have a balanced diet, so you're doing say one or two servings of fish per day, I would say you probably don't, or sorry, one or two servings of fish per week. Uh, you probably don't need more than one to one and a half grams of omega-3 fatty acids in a day. Um, but if you're really limited in the amount of food that you can tolerate, um, you can take more in supplement form, of course. Uh, questions related to um, gluten sensitivities and celiac and testing. Um, so I think a few people said they feel better without gluten. Um, but their test for celiac was negative several times. And so is there a test I can take to see if I have a gluten intolerance? And the answer to that is no, we don't have a test or a biomarker for gluten intolerance. Um, that would be more of a clinical diagnosis. So if you've done an elimination approach and you've noticed your fatigue and your brain fog and your pain are better without gluten, I would say you have more of an intolerance to gluten and you can go ahead and stay away from it. Um, celiac disease is actually an autoimmune condition uh, that people develop. So you can have a gluten intolerance without having celiac disease, and you can go ahead and, and just, um, you know, sort of um, uh, trust your body and how it feels without uh, taking gluten in. Um, other folks asked, is there any benefit to vitamin B12 or iron supplements if my blood work is normal? So as a general recommendation, uh, we say aim for a ferritin of over 100. If fatigue is a problem, that's not really evidence-based. I don't have um, really good data to show you that, but from a patient experience perspective, uh, they just tend to feel better from a fatigue-wise fatigue if their ferritin is over 100. Um, once your ferritin is over 100 and it's stable there, you can discontinue your iron supplements or hold off on them. It usually takes about three months of iron supplementation every second day before we uh, see a bump in that ferritin level. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I actually don't know any data related to vitamin B12. Maybe uh, Dr. Arsenault can, can jump in here if he, he knows otherwise, but I, I don't know of any benefit to taking vitamin B12 if your levels are normal. I'll take Rick's silence as a, as a no as well. Um, 
So can you share some spreadable fats for toasts that are outside of butter and margarine? So lots of things. Um, so avocado or mashed into a guacamole you can put on your toast, um, cottage cheese as well. I think I was just at Superstore the other day. We now have lactose-free options um, if you don't do well with lactose. And cottage cheese is a great source of, of protein. So I think if I go back to uh, this chart here, <clears throat> half a cup of cottage cheese has about 14 grams of, of protein. So that's a great way to, to start your day with protein <clears throat> if you're looking to get a little bit more in. Um, hummus is really nice too. And then of course, peanut butter, almond butter, um, any kind of nut butter are great options to put on your toast as well. Uh, one of the questions was related to one of the resources that I shared, which was Cookspiration. Is it a paid website? And absolutely not. It's a free resource and it's through the Dietitians of Canada. So it will continue to always be free. Uh, one of the most popular questions is what are some vegetarian protein options? Um, and so again, you can feel free to screenshot this if you want this tonight and, and can't wait until the slides are come out. Um, people always want to know how can I get protein without eating animal uh, content. So Greek yogurt, one cup, about 23 grams of protein. Lentils, four grams if you're looking at a quarter cup of cooked lentils. Um, cottage cheese, like I mentioned, is about 14 grams. And things like peas, edamame, chia seeds, and hemp seeds are fantastic too. And then if you're specifically looking for uh, plant-based sources, um, green peas, spinach, um, kale is really good. Um, avocado actually surprisingly has a decent amount of protein, um, as do mushrooms and Brussels sprouts. So you're probably all getting more protein than you realize. And this is a really nice example of how you don't just have to eat chicken, turkey, and fish to get your protein. Um, there are lots of other ways that you can incorporate it into your diet. And again, for those of you who have a lot of um, food sensitivities, FODMAP diet requirements, MCAS, um, you can see there's lots of ways you can mix and match to, to get the protein that you need. Uh, another popular one is coconut oil good or bad. So coconut oil had its, I'll say its moment. Uh, I wanna say like uh, five or seven years ago where everyone thought coconut oil is fantastic. Um, they've done some really good um, studies. The American Heart Association has specifically commented saying coconut oil increases your LDL or, or bad cholesterol and is a significant source of those fats we wanna stay away from, which is our saturated fats. And so I would not use this as a regular source of a cooking fat. Um, I would still stick to the avocado oils um, and then otherwise a grapeseed oil is fine as well if you're looking for a high smoke point. Uh, I really like this question uh, because my husband recently got a creamy uh, despite my um, objections uh, because he has a really big sweet tooth and wanted to find other ways that he could get um, that sweet taste without all the excess calories and sugars. And so the question was, if I get a Ninja Creamy and make banana ice cream, is that still a sweet to avoid? Um, and so my answer to this is, it's the content of your food and not the label. So ice cream that comes off a shelf is very different than a creamy ice cream that you're making, which is made of, as I just learned last week, uh, milk, banana, and ice. So that the Ninja Creamy essentially churns these um, uh, kind of whole, whole foods into what tastes like a regular ice cream, which I think is fantastic. So please feel free to enjoy that. And remember, it's the content of what's in your food. It's not the label that's important. Uh, and then is fish okay with the FODMAP diet? So yes, absolutely, fish is great. Um, so meats tend to actually be naturally free of FODMAPs. Um, and again, it's those processed and marinated meats, um, whether they get pre-marinated um, in your butcher shop um, or you buy those packaged marinations that have the FODMAPs like garlic and onion that people tend to react to. Um, this is my favorite question. Um, I think out of all of them, can I eat frozen vegetables and fruit? Um, and I love that I get to say yes, because I really enjoy having these in my own freezer. Um, the nutrition is maintained. I think I asked like six or seven dietitians when I started doing this myself. The nutrition is maintained. Sometimes the quality of the fruits is actually better because they're flash frozen as soon as they're picked. Um, 
and it's cheaper, which means it's more economical. Um, and I think most importantly, it's easier with less chopping and preparation. Um, and so things like strawberries, bananas, I've seen frozen avocado. Um, my favorite is frozen onion because they, it comes pre-chopped. Um, all of those things are perfectly fine to use. And no, they are not processed um, uh, when they're frozen. Um, someone else asked about um, homemade juices um, relative to store-bought juices. And I think homemade juices are an awesome choice. Um, there's a patent on some of the old juicers that came out that have expired. So now you can get really <clears throat> affordable ju juicers off Amazon that are of good quality and you can make your own uh, juices at home if you want. Uh, and then I had lots and lots of questions. Um, I think from the same six or seven patients about MCS or mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that I, I couldn't answer all of those questions. Some of them are very specific. Um, some of them need a lot more time to answer. Um, and my colleagues at the Complex Chronic Disease Program, specifically Michelle and Sam, um, coincidentally are doing a talk on mast cell activation syndrome and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, it's Tuesday, March 12th from 1 to 3, uh, 1.30 to 3. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the um, uh, link in the chat, oh, uh, just in the Q&A box here. Uh, oh, and it looks, looks like as a host, uh, I actually can't submit my own uh, questions. So maybe what I'll do is these, the link will go out um, with the slides. Um, and so you'll have lots of time to, to sign up uh, that way when you get my slides um, and it'll just be a registration uh, through PHSA. Um, and I will say, um, Michelle and Sam are just a fabulous source of information for uh, mast cell activation. So I think the full 90 minutes will be um, probably very helpful for those of you who have those very specific questions. Um, that is the end of the, the questions I did not get a chance to address. Um, if there's time left at the end, I will go through some of those resources again to give folks an idea of where to start with some of the recommendations that we, we made. But I'm going to spend the next, uh, looks like 35 minutes answering the remaining 100 questions that we have here. Um, and before I do that, Rick, is there anything that you want to add um, in terms of your experience with pain, nutrition, the foods that we eat, chronic fatigue syndrome? No, I think you're doing a great job. I'm learning a lot. Great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start from the very top. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to need a second as I go through them to read them. Um, I'll skip through them if we've already answered it to some capacity. Um, and I think these slides are probably going to be a bit distracting. I see I'm still sideways, which is also probably distracting for everyone. But I won't, uh, I won't take away from our time by trying to fix it. Um, okay. So is it beneficial to keep our blood sugars low or do intermittent fasting? I've noticed my inflammation comes down if I fast and my brain fog improves. That's a really great question. We talked a little bit about intermittent fasting. I don't have any robust data on um, the connection between intermittent fasting and chronic pain or central sensitivity syndromes. Um, there is some data showing that intermittent fasting can be helpful for weight loss and the short to medium term, but not long term. Um, so I, I would say if you're finding that intermittent fasting is helpful, um, you're welcome to keep doing it. I would caution you on keeping your blood sugars persistently low uh, because remember your body needs glucose to produce oxygen so that you have the energy to keep your body going. So there's a difference between having persistently low blood sugars and intermittent fasting where you don't eat for 16 hours. So just caution there and there that you're, you're, you're not trending downwards uh, in your blood sugars all the time. Uh, question on MCAS. So Jennifer, I, I, there's a whole uh, talk coming up on that. Um, 
Rochelle asks, I want to eat more of a Mediterranean diet, but I struggle to keep iron levels up. Any suggestions? Um, yes, that I actually, I'm sorry I didn't um, include a component on that. Um, I have a whole chart on, on iron levels and certain foods, so I can include that in the um, slides that I send out. I think lots of people have that, that same question. Uh, this question is probably one Rick can answer. Will part one be posted on the ME TV YouTube channel? Um, uh, Rick, any? Yes, any? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so you guys can all rewatch it there with the slides that are sent out. Uh, I have issues with significant bloating and pain made worse with trying even small amounts of fermented food. What do you suggest? I'm on PEA for a month. Um, Andrea, I apologize. This is probably one of those questions that I, I'd probably need a lot more nuance and context to answer. Um, so I, I'm sorry I won't be able to answer just those uh, that specific question of yours. Um, I, I would recommend perhaps a dietitian or a nutritionist to kind of work around some of these things, um, or even speaking with a physician one on one, um, just because these types of answers need a lot of one on one time, and and it's hard to do that in a group setting. Uh, someone asked about the keto diet. Um, does limiting carbs in a more extreme way help relieve symptoms of chronic pain and fatigue? Um, it seems like a stressful, difficult diet. So I, I hope I answered that question, uh, Vanessa, through the slides. Um, the keto diet is actually okay for weight loss. Um, but again, for anyone who has a, like a really limited contracted energy envelope, um, I don't think limiting carbs is um, doing you any favors. Um, you're correct. It is a stressful, difficult diet. I would focus more uh, for yourself on optimizing that protein content and making sure you're having that balanced micronutrient content we talked about with the portioning of the plate. And again, maybe trying to find some carbs that are whole grain or less refined. So you're maybe not getting um, those big pro-inflammatory reactions with a lot of that processed carbohydrates. Um, Alex asked a wonderful question that I actually don't have an answer to. <laughs> um, I, I actually also really enjoyed the carbonated water drinks like San Pellegrino and Bubbly. Um, could they cause inflammation? Um, I've thought about this myself. Um, they are carbonated, which means they have more gas in them. Um, I don't think they should cause more inflammation. Um, they might make you a bit more bloated and gassy and more reflux. Um, I would maybe track how you feel in terms of your symptoms when you drink carbonated water uh, versus when you don't drink carbonated water. Um, but it, it's definitely a great question that in theory, I think should not trigger a pro-inflammatory response. Uh... Can a vitamin B12 make your pain worse? Um, I don't know if that meant a vitamin B12 supplement. I don't see any reason why it would make your pain worse. And can a calcium vitamin make your heart flutter? Certainly calcium irregularities uh, can make for uh, various dysrhythmias or cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you're within your daily recommended allowance. Um, and if you're taking a lot of calcium, just getting your calcium checked through your family physician. Um, and definitely, if you have a cardiac issue, particularly a dysrhythmia, I'd, I'd run the amount of calcium that you're taking by your cardiologist. Uh, and Vicky, I apologize, your question about the constant buzzing, shocking sensation, I, I'd probably just need to know like more about that in a in a one to one patient setting. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that question. I apologize. Uh, Shawani asked a great question about transitioning from an Indian diet to a Mediterranean diet. Uh, what could I delete or add from the Indian diet so it's closer to a Mediterranean diet? Um, my background is obviously South Asian, so I can, I can answer this in a bit of nuance. I actually think a traditional Indian diet is reasonably similar to a Mediterranean diet without the fish. Uh, so the one thing you can add into your traditional South Asian diet is more fish, particularly your fatty fishes like salmon. Um, the focus on legumes, uh, vegetables, um, and lentils is fantastic. Um, but there's also a big focus on sweets in the Indian diet and deep fried fruits like samosas. Um, and so I would take away the things that are deep fried and highly sugar based. I would maintain the traditional diet with the fruits, vegetables, and lentils, and then I'd add the fish into the Indian diet as well. I hope that's that's helpful and gives you a starting point. 
Uh, can vegetarians and type 2 diabetics eat the Mediterranean diet? Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's it's actually one of the options for folks who are type 2 diabetics um, and obviously vegetarian as well. Again, you don't have to do the fish options for the Mediterranean diet. There were those alternative plant-based proteins that were available. Just make sure that you try and get those omega-3 fatty acids if you're not going to do the, the seafood um, in other forms. Uh, David asked about taking Metamucil on a daily basis. So Metamucil is a source of fiber. If you tend to run on the constipated side um, or you have IBS with a constipation variant, um, taking a, uh, a tablespoon of Metamucil or twice a day is fine. Um, there's also other ways that you can get your fiber intake if you need to. So you don't necessarily have to rely on Metamucil. Uh, but if you need a little bit of that extra push with the Metamucil, um, there's no reason why you can't. It's, it's just fiber. Um, <laughs> Lisa said the video view is sideways and it's distracting. I, I apologize. I, I don't know why it's sideways. I obviously haven't had this happen before. Um, I told Rick, of course, it happens when I have a um, 100 folks to, to speak to. I'm sorry, Lisa. I, I can't fix that. Um, so Mandy commented on, on the price of a lot of the foods, especially with um, inflation and grocery prices. Um, that's a wonderful and very appropriate comment to make. Um, I mentioned last time that if you're looking for um, one of the cheaper options of fish and salmon and protein in general, if you have a Costco membership, buying a large portion and then freezing it is one way. Um, uh, I think Costco is some of the cheapest um, pound to dollar ratios that I've found. Otherwise, I, I, I completely understand and I, I'd encourage you to focus on those um, plant-based sources of protein um, uh, where you can and where you financially can as well. Um, if you don't eat fish, especially salmon, so like I mentioned, um, there, there are other ways to get those omega-3 fatty acids, which is the benefit from the sa uh, salmon uh, through supplements. Uh, Vanessa said, what do you do when it feels like complex carbs take way too long to digest and get the energy from? I find it hard to get off simpler carbs for this reason. Um, that's a great question, Vanessa, that I, I probably, again, can't answer just um, uh, in this session. Um, that probably sounds like something that you'd probably want to work with a practitioner one-to-one. Um, -one. Uh Someone asked about minimum two liters per day, but is there a safe maximum? How much are before we're diluting the efficiency of prescriptions, multivitamins? I could drink five liters pretty easily and no one will tell me if that's too much. Um, I'm gonna pull Rick in here. Rick, what do you what do you tell your patients for their maximum daily fluid intake? I think you know, one of the worries is that there are lots of stories and cases where patients who are slightly dehydrated who drink too much water, they get waterlogged, the brain swells, and they can even potentially have a seizure and die. And so the, the reality is that if your volume status, if your salt balance in your body is normal, you could drink pretty much, unless you're doing a crazy amount, your body will get rid of it. It's when you're you're not you don't have enough salt on board that it becomes an issue. And I think that anything above four liters, you know, if you're if you're dehydrated can be a problem. But if you're not dehydrated from a salt perspective, you can pretty much have as much fluid as you want. Great. That that's exactly what I say as well. I say I, I wouldn't do more than four. If your sodium levels are normal, you can keep and your kidneys are functioning normally, you can drink as much as you like. Um, uh, there's not a hard and fast rule on, on fluid intake there. So I agree with you there, Rick. Um, is store-bought pasta considered ultra-processed? Um, Jonathan, look at the back. Um, if you recognize the ingredients um, and it doesn't look like scientific jargon, um, you're probably okay. There's all sorts of different um, brands of pasta out there. Some are ultra-processed, um, <clears throat> some are not. 
Um, and so I'd really focus on reading the nutrition labels and the ingredients um, because there is actually a spectrum of uh, various types of pasta that can be made. So you can buy anything from handmade pasta from a fine food store, uh, which is probably as good as you can get to something boxed um, that, that probably your body won't agree with. Um, someone asked a question about um, their dietary uh, patterns as a child um, and how that may have influenced their chronic illnesses they have now. Um, it's hard for me to say retrospectively. Um, <clears throat> certainly our bodies when they're young are susceptible, uh, just like they're susceptible to trauma um, and, and the, the impact on our mental health. Um, I would suspect that there's probably a correlation between needing highly processed foods as a child and chronic illness later on, but I, 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 I don't have any specific studies that I can think of off the top of my head, but my clinical impression and guess is um, if you had a very high ultra-processed diet, uh, it probably leads to a higher risk of, of chronic illnesses um, as an adult. Uh, what about carbonated beverages that use cane sugar or other natural sugars? Uh, probably not as bad as a can of Coke, um, but again, just keep an eye on, on how much sugar you're getting uh, on a daily basis. And if you're having five or six of those sugared carbonated beverages, keeping track of how much that even that, that natural or cane sugar that you're having. Uh... Someone had a question about debilitating nausea. Um, again, it's tough for me to answer these very specific questions that are related to, to patients. In general, um, similar to, to what we'd recommend to our pregnant patients is eating multiple small meals per day, spaced out over time instead of high, um, high volumes of food um, spread out throughout the day. Um, but otherwise, I think it's with the... I think, I think a question like that, Caroline, I, I would not be able to answer just in a setting like this, so I apologize. Um, Nana asked about fresh pressed homemade fruits, vegetable juices. I think that was answered through the slides. Um, sourdough bread, um, yeah, definitely a better option um, than fully white, um, white bread, um, especially if you make it at home. And then same thing about pork, it's definitely a red meat. It is actually one of the specific meats that we've recognized as a as a class one carcinogen. Um, if you want to have it once a month, um, please feel free to go ahead. But if you're able to adjust that as a, a regular, um, something that's a regular part of your diet, I'd, I'd probably do that shift if you're able to. Is there a good substitute for butter or margarine for vegans? Um, Christine, I guess it depends on the context that you're using it in. Um, lots of recipes lately that say, go ahead and substitute olive oil for butter if you're interested. Um, so I'd maybe start there um, as, as a starting point. I think um, sometimes I've just done like one-to-one -one ratios of like butter to olive oil. So if it says like three teaspoons butter, I'll do like three teaspoons of olive oil. And I haven't actually had a problem with my cooking, but I guess it, it depends on what you're cooking. Um, but I also find it helpful if you go into the comment section. Someone usually asks if your recipe is from a website, can I substitute the butter for olive oil? And the author of the recipe usually gives a response. So that's I, that's where I started from. And I, I find that it's a, it's a good place to start if you just want to put an olive oil in place. Um... So someone asked about frying foods, make them ultra processed. Um, so it's the type of oils that we're using and the way that we heat them. Um, so for instance, um, French fries from McDonald's, um, the oils that are used there are di very different than say in olive oil where you're pan frying your, your piece of salmon at home. Um, so absolutely those fried foods um, definitely does, especially if they're in a takeout version, definitely makes them ultra processed. I think we commented a bit on on the differences between grass finished beef and and just the regular processed meats we get from our our stores. Um, Mary asked a question about what I'm assuming is um, uh, sort of this new trend that, that came out a couple of years ago about fake meat products that are not actually meat but um, sort of lab grown. Um, I don't love the idea of it. Um, I think if you're manufacturing food, um, 
you're probably processing it and creating additives. And in fact, if you look at the boxes of those uh, sort of fake meat products, um, they are incredibly processed and salty. Um, and therefore, I, I probably would not recommend them on a regular or even semi-regular basis. And so that's my way of uh, very neutrally commenting on, um, on that industry. Um, Judy asked about why steak considered a processed food. Um, what about organ meats like liver, heart, tongue? Um, so like I mentioned, the, the other types of red meats, um, if they're not highly processed, um, are better. Um, better red meats than others. Um, but in general, red meats um, tend to be more pro-inflammatory than our lean white meats. So if you like your liver or your heart or your tongue, Judy, you know, you're, you're welcome to have those and know that's a better option um, than say the hot dogs and, and bacon that we get off our shelves. Um, and again, the steak, it depends on the cut. It depends on how it's been preserved and, and packaged. Um, and so again, if you're going to a butcher shop and they've cut you a fresh piece, piece of steak and you're taking it home and you're cooking it right away, uh, probably much better than something you're getting from a store shelf that's frozen. Um, so again, it, it all exists on a spectrum. Um, but as a general rule, if I can comment on the red meats, it's that all red meats are more pro-inflammatory than our lean white meats and our salmon. Um, someone mentioned they have orange juice where no, there's no added sugar. It's 100% orange juice. Um, again, it depends on, on um, if there's anything else in it and how it's made. But if you're doing fresh made orange juice at home, I say that that's great. Uh, Jonathan asked a question about cereal. Again, I also, um, like many of you, probably grew up on breakfast cereal. Um, I, ate, I ate a lot of it actually growing up. Um, but if you look at the back of the box, um, again, things like shreddies, Cheerios, definitely Fruit Loops. Um, again, it's less about the label and more about what's in the cereal itself. So if you're able to get something that um, is less processed with less refined flour and um, refined carbohydrates, great. Um, so not all, all cereals are the same. Uh, Mary said, do you recommend regular bone broth? Um, I don't know much actually about the benefits or adverse effects of bone broth. Um, I do enjoy drinking it myself for taste. It's a nice source of protein and collagen. Um, I can't say I have any evidence or data to recommend for or against it on a regular basis. Um, I would say that they're usually quite salty. Um, so if you have high cholesterol or heart disease or hypertension, I'd be careful in that regard. Um, but otherwise, if you make homemade bone broth, I think it's a great source of protein and collagen. I, I wouldn't have any objections to it off the top of my head. <clears throat> um, I think uh, Megan asked a similar question about the grass-fed beef. I think I've answered it in a few different ways. Um, and I so my answer to you is if you want to do your grass-fed beef twice a month, uh, please go ahead to maintain your, your iron stores. Um, almond butter, um, natural almond butter that's not, um, that's, that's just almond um, is a great way to get um, healthy fats. Um, commented on the frozen vegetables. Um, canola oil, uh, it depends on who you ask, Marina. Um, some people are really against canola oil, um, others aren't. Um, my answer to that is to probably using it, is it more sparingly than not? I wouldn't call it a healthy oil. Um, I And I definitely wouldn't encourage using it all the time, but if you wanna use it on the odd time here or there, you can. Um, but I definitely wouldn't use it as a regular substitute for olive oil. Uh, Natasha asked about eating two full eggs per day. Um, there's nothing dangerous about it. I, again, um, if you have any history of like dyslipidemia or cholesterol issues, um, eggs do tend to be high um, if, in cholesterol. So I would remove the yolk. If you're going to have two every day and maybe do one egg and then uh, the equivalent of an egg white if you're able to. Um, but if you don't have any issues with cholesterol and you don't have any heart problems, you're, you're welcome to eat the, the two eggs per day. Uh, GMO foods, Sean, <laughs> that's a whole, that's a whole, I could do like a 90 minute talk on that. It depends on who you ask. The farmers say they really need it to maintain our food supply. 
and other people say they're con contributing to chronic illnesses. So I don't have a, I don't have an opinion one way or another because I, I just, I just haven't gone through the data well enough. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to defer my my answer to that. Um, Jen commented on um, females in her family having low iron and needing iron infusions. Um, and is it okay to have red meat twice a week or that was a recommendation? Um, I don't think I, I, I probably, I don't think I've ever made a recommendation to a patient to have twice a week red meat. I would probably recommend to have foods that are high in iron to support the dietary intake of iron. Um, uh, so I, I would maybe see if there's other ways that you can, you can get your red meat, um, or sorry, your, your iron through non-red meat options. Um, but if that's the only thing that works for you, again, I said, these are overarching recommendations. It's not a one size fits all. So this is a really great example. If red meat's the only way you can maintain your iron on top of iron infusions, um, that's probably the, the best answer for you. Uh, Mary said, will I do a talk on healthy weight loss post chronic illness? Um, so Mary, I'm not, I'm not a dietitian and I'm probably not the best person to talk about specific weight loss. Um, but I think that some of our colleagues who are coming on who do that type of work on a regular basis, um, that Rick's inviting, um, like the dietitians might be a, a more informed source on specific ways to, to lose weight. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to my colleagues there. Um, another question about canola oil that I think we answered. Um, someone asked about unsalted brown rice cakes. I'm sorry, Margaret. I actually, I, I'm not really familiar with the, the rice cake, so I, I can't comment on that specifically. Um, but you can probably predict my answer now is that if you're going to have rice cakes, an unsalted brown rice version is better than a salted, uh, finely processed rice cake. Um, Jen asked about menu plans with easy meal options for days when they're in bed. So Jen, I would check out the Cookspiration website that's going to be um, sent around in the links, both in part one and part two. Um, I don't think I'll have time to go through that resource. Um, we just have about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, but definitely um, cookspiration.com. I did the demo last time. Um, it can basically create a meal plan for you, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, based on your dietary needs, like gluten-free or vegetarian. So definitely there, there's that resource in there. Um, do I worry about cholesterol and seafood? Um, so I think Terry, um, not particularly. Um, there is, I think the alternatives to what people eat um, to seafood, again, not to harp on red meat, but I like red meat, uh, a lot higher source of cholesterol than seafood. So no, I, I don't worry about the cholesterol content there. Um, Melina asked about the wine limits. Are they still current given the most recent guidelines? Um, no, they're not. So the Mediterranean diet guidelines for wine are different than the Canadian alcohol guidelines, which are a lot more stringent than new Canadian guidelines than the Mediterranean ones. Um, Katrin asked about protein powders. I really like them. I, th I think it's a nice, simple way to get protein in um, through a morning uh, uh, smoothie. That's how I like to do them. Um, they are expensive. Um, and there's all sorts of different kinds. Um, I think I've had some patients who, um, there's a certain type of protein powder that um, actually gives people um, outbreaks in their skin and acne. And I, I forget the term for that protein powder off the top of my head. So try and find something that, that is affordable for you that you don't react to negatively. Uh, but I, I, I like them as an option. Um, Kim, Kim said, how are ghee and avocado oil classified? Um, avocado oil, great option, especially for those high smoke points. Um, ghee depends on how it's made. If it comes from the store or you go to the traditional Indian stores and it's in the package, I, I'd probably, um, probably stay away from that. Um, again, in the traditional um, sub-Indian contents, a lot of that ghee was handmade, hand-churned. There were until 10 of additives and preservatives added. So those are, um, I would almost say that's like comparing apples to oranges in terms of North American ghee on the shelf versus ghee that's made um, uh, traditionally on the farms. 
A uh, few questions about avocado oil that we answered, same as the pork chops, we've answered that. Um, same as the avocado and the grapeseed oil. I think I had a slide on grapeseed oil. I'm not sure why. Um, uh, I think I had, uh, I thought I had commented on it. Um, grapeseed oil is um, not as good as olive oil in terms of omega-3 fatty acid content, uh, but it's definitely a better option than canola oil. And so if you're looking for a high smoke point uh, for cooking, um, you can substitute avocado oil and grapeseed oil. If you're going to be making like a salad dressing or just doing regular cooking without that high smoke point, I'd stick to the olive oil. Um, and Melina, you're correct. There is actually no safe amount of alcohol that is recommended. There is no safe amount, um, but there are recommendations that can help reduce the risk of adverse consequences of alcohol. And that's what the new Canadian guidelines recommend. And you're, you're right, they do make a specific comment how there is no safe amount of alcohol. Um, Evelyn asked about beer. Can we drink beer? Um, beer is actually um, highly carbonated, um, fermented, um, and dense in calories and sugar. Um, so it, I would actually recommend a glass of wine over that glass of beer. Um, <clears throat> uh, low FADMAP diet for general IBS symptoms. Um, I think that's that's kind of the grade A gold standard place to start if you have IBS symptoms. So definitely go ahead and start if that's something that you're um, interested in. It is a bit tough to do on your own. So if there's someone you can find who um, has some training in that area, like a dietitian or a nutritionist, uh, I'd recommend that. Uh, my comments on lectins being inflammatory. Um, Lynn, I'm just going to park that question. I, I don't think I have enough time to answer that one. I'm just going to try and get through a couple more of these uh, before we run out of time. Um, uh, Let's see here. I've lost my spot. Um, I'm happy to go over time if, if folks want to stay an extra five minutes, Rick. I, um, I, I don't know if that's okay with you. Um, I answered the question Absolutely. about the sourdough. Um, uh, we talked about the pots, Amanda, about the recommendation for the salt. So that quarter teaspoon of salt four times a day. Um, yes, omega-3s are located in chia seeds. So that's a really nice source. Um, another question about uh, coconut oil. Um, it's not that it's not safe, um, my to have extra virgin olive oil in high heat. Like I, I wouldn't do it all the time. Like it, it does actually create breakdown products. So if you're going to do high heat, I'd, I'd probably do like an avocado or a grapeseed oil. Um, Sheila said something about a fish oil with my recommended ratio. Um, I don't know the brands off the top of my head, Sheila. Um, if you're having that issue, there might be other folks too. So I'll, I'll put a little addendum for some recommendations after I, I chat with a few folks um, for maybe some places where you can find that fish oil uh, ratio that I'm recommended. Uh... Uh, Janella, I'm going to defer this question about MCAS and calcium intake to my colleagues in March. Um, that's a bit bit too specific uh, for me to answer in this setting. Um, uh, someone asked about algae-based um, omegas. Um, yes, that's fine. Again, as long as you're getting... Uh, the number of gram or milligrams of omega-3s that are recommended. It doesn't matter what the source is. Uh, canola oil, isn't that a bad oil? So yeah, I gave my opinion on, on what I think about canola oil. Definitely wouldn't use it all the time. Um, sunflower seed butter. Uh, Margaret, I, I feel like I learned something new all the time. I actually didn't know there was sunflower seed butter. I, it's, I, I, I don't know anything about it, so I, I won't be able to answer that question. Um, touched on the protein powder. Um, someone asked about the chicken fish turkey and that they feel better. This came up last time too, about how some people feel better eating 
um, animal-based protein, and it, it might just be that you you respond better to animal protein content from an energy and muscle building perspective. Um, I don't have a specific explanation as to, to why that is. Um, but again, like I said, I, um, I, I would follow with what your body tells you and responds well to. Um, and so if you do well with animal sources of protein, please, please continue with that. Uh, so I think Katerina asked about various sources of, um, or alternatives to protein um, versus high yogurt with high saturated fat. So I'll, I'll just defer to that table that uh, I put up there with uh, about 10 or 15 options for other ways to get your protein. Uh, Marina asked about brands of PEA. I don't recommend any specific brands for supplements. I, um, I, I would say I would go to your local uh, nutraceutical or, or pharmacy and see what they have available there and look at the price point. Um, I mentioned last time briefly, the supplement industry is not regulated. Um, it's not like medications where you have Health Canada or in the States, the FDA. So it's hard for me to talk about brands. Um, and so I don't, I, 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 I don't say that in general, what I said last time was the brand AOR uh, tends to be well received by the patients at the CCDP who I've worked with. Uh, for many years. Um, so I'd, I'd go with that. And that's AOR. Uh, but again, that's not me endorsing them because I, uh, it's just patients have had good experiences with them. Uh, someone asked a question. I, I sorry, I wasn't able to understand that question, Janet. Um, Marina, I will send out that table on iron levels in food. Uh, So Gordon asked a great question about iron levels and fatigue. So we usually say if you have persistently low ferritin levels and your hemoglobin is low and you have tried three to six months of iron supplements, you're probably a good candidate for IV iron. Um, those are the hospital's requirements. I know at Burnaby, Mount St. Joseph for IV infusions under MSP. I do not think they'll take you if your ferritin is say 30 and your hemoglobin is normal. So if you're looking for an iron infusion for that reason, I think that would end up being a, a private pay. And there are a few options in the lower mainland um, that I'm aware of. Uh, Andrea um, and Rick, maybe you can chime in here too. I always say, you know, try and keep your ferritin over a hundred patients tend to feel better. Is that your recommendation as well? So there's a Canadian study that shows that women, even if they don't have chronic fatigue syndrome, are uh, have fatigue and get better if their ferritin is above 50. And so I, I usually try and say at least a minimum of 50, and the closer you are to 100, the better. Great. Okay, so we're on the same page about that as well. So I hope that answers your question there. Um, <clears throat> are raw vegetables better than cooked vegetables? Um, I think, Mandy, some of the benefits of the cooked vegetables is the seasonings that are incorporated, like, say, turmeric, which is anti-inflammatory, um, pepper, um, the vegetable seasonings. Um, sometimes you can get an increase in the available nutrient if you cook a food um, versus eating it raw, but it depends on the food that you're eating. Um, and so for that, those specific questions about cooked versus raw, um, again, I defer to folks who do a little bit more work in this area like a like a dietitian. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give a more nuanced answer than that. Um, Claire said, why isn't yogurt ultra processed? Um, it depends on the type of yogurt that you're you're eating. So last week I sent out um, a recipe for um, making your own fermented yogurt. Um, I, I don't know if anyone used that recipe or tried it, um, but I can send that out again. Um, uh, through these slides as well. Um, so again, I, I think it just comes down to just not the label of the food, um, but it's how it's made. So I'd, I'd look on the back of, um, of, of the cartons that you're, you're, um, you're buying. Um, I'm sorry, Claire, I don't quite understand that comment. Um, and someone asked about 
the specific LDL particle sizes? I, I don't know the answer to that, that question. Um, there are certain components, well, I, sorry, I do sort of know the answer to this. There are certain parts of the LDL cholesterol that are, um, that attach, that promote the production of cholesterol. Um, uh, but in general, it's our LDL levels that we're looking at overall. So we actually can't measure specific micro parts of the LDL when you do your blood work. So we look at LDL in general um, as a marker. So I wouldn't get more specific in that than that um, when we talk about LDL levels. Um, no, I don't have any concerns about monk fruit sweetener and baking. Um, you can also use um, figs are really nice. Dates are really nice too. They're nice natural sweeteners. Also mashed banana is a really nice alternative as well. Um, alternatives to milk. I'm assuming, Kim, you're talking about lactose, um, you, which you are. Uh, well, that was your next line. Um, you can get lots of lactose-free products. So you can get 2% milk um, by Fairleaf or Fairview. It's one of those brands um, that's lactose-free milk uh, where they filtered out the protein. Um, that's more expensive, though. So two liter will run you at $5.99, whereas a four liter of non or of just regular milk is $5.99. So you're paying double the price, um, but there are those options. Then you can do almond milk um, and oat milk too. Um, but again, just be careful and, and how many added sugars or flavorings um, those can have. So there's anything from like vanilla or hazelnut almond milk, which you probably probably don't want. Um, frozen foods. So Marina, mean, I think it just depends on what kind of frozen foods you're looking at. Um, um, I'm sure there's there's added chemicals to frozen meals that you get out of the um, uh, out of the freezer section. So again, I'd, I'd look at the back. Um, I I didn't have a specific comment on tofu or soy, um, Nana. Um, they're not to be avoided or limited. Um, so you're you're welcome to have them, um, of course, in moderation as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an electrolyte recipe. Uh, uh, Bente Wallace, um, I, I haven't been asked that before, um, so I, I can't help there. Uh, Kimberly, uh, you asked about the supplement for ferritin levels. Um, I usually say uh, Ferramax every other day is fine. Um, if you're pregnant, we ask for Palifor um, every second day. Again, minimum three months. Um, Rochelle, best way to manage cravings for sugar or comfort foods, um, make alternatives. Um, so someone mentioned they really like sweets and they bought a creamy. That's a more of an expensive alternative. Um, but there are lots of options available um, where you can create substitutions with less sugar, less refined sugars and processed sugars and still get a sweetness taste. So um, for instance, I made my little toddler banana muffins and all the sweetness came from bananas. I actually didn't have to add any sugars to it. So, um, if you have access to the internet, there's lots of different ways that you can have that sweet taste without having that, um, pro-inflammatory sugar component added as well. Uh, Megan asked about low blood sugar. What should it be at? Uh, varies, um, from the time of day to whether you're pre or postprandial or before or after a meal, uh, we usually recommend anything from five, uh, five to nine, depending on how soon or long it's been since you've eaten. Um, someone asked about a comment on tomatoes. Um, tomatoes are usually recommend not recommended in the FODMAPS diet. I I don't know specifically about um, the inflammatory process. I, I haven't read any data around the tomatoes. Uh, someone asked about the YouTube videos to rewatch them. Um, they are available through Rick's, Rick's website, I believe under resources. Um, and Anna asked, yes, I, I will email out um, or I'll get Bruno to email out both part one and part two and you can watch it on the YouTube channel. Um, Someone made a comment, there's a certain part of Indians that, or certain type of Indians who eat lots of fish, which I think is fantastic. You're right. Um, I think I was focusing more on um, the Northern states of India uh, where there really isn't access to fish. I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, we're out of time, five minutes after. Okay, I think we just about got through it all. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry for, for those who I couldn't quite get to, uh, but I'll get Bruno to save these questions and, and I'll do a little Q and A, um, 
for what I can and on part two of the slides. So some addendums to come. Uh, so thank you everyone for sticking around for so long and, and Rick for sticking after seven. Um, I hope you all walked away a little bit more information than you had uh, before 5.30. Thank you, you're a wonderful speaker and I've learned a lot today. So thank you again. Thanks for having Bye, me. Bye everybody. Bye.